Welcome to Ask Antar. This is a show for the city of Jackson that is co-hosted by myself, but really the star of the show, the residents and our mayor, Joe Quay. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you again for, um, for relaying the questions. I think the true star is the questions uh, and, and just our ability to address them. So, of course, if, the, if you're new to our Ask Antar show, how it works is you residents uh, email us questions. And so you can see here I have a list of lots and lots of questions that people have emailed in. You can also post the questions on social media. And then once a month, you and I have a chance to sit down and we actually answer the questions as they come in mm -hmm. and tell them how many of these questions have you seen? Uh, absolutely none. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's cold answering and then we just kind of flip around. So you ready to get started? I am. All yes. Right. Um, the first question, I'm going to read the whole thing because I thought it was really awesome how he wrote it, okay? Okay. This guy says, I currently work with the Signals Division of the City of Jackson. I would love to have you visit our facilities here at Hawkins Field to see the state of it. I enjoy my job, the people I work with, but new equipment and materials are sorely needed. Give me a little bit of your time and it will be well spent. P.S. The Lions made a great late run in the playoffs. <laughs> well, he, he put a little uh, sweetener on the end of the question. I, I, you know, maybe that, that helps my answer. Uh, no, I, I appreciate the invitation. Um, and, you know, I want to be clear, uh, not only in res with respect to this question, uh, but to all of the divisions. I don't hold this perspective that, you know, because I'm the mayor, I understand what the solutions need to be. Uh, I don't really feel that city employees work for me or work for our administration. I feel that they work with, we work with one another. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to profit from their collective genius. Uh, I'm grateful for the invitation to come to the signals division. Uh, and not that I could not have gone previously, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of divisions, a lot of areas of operation in the city. And, and sometimes uh, maybe we don't prioritize the opportunity to visit uh, as many divisions as we could. And so I, I, I will uh, take them up on that, and I appreciate that invitation. Uh, we know that our residents are consistently uh, raising up the challenge with our signals. Uh, we know that there's one that's being worked on as I speak on Terry Road. We had a truck to come through and oh, wow. uh, tear down the, the pole, and uh, as they were working on it, another truck came and, and finished off what, uh, what the, le the other truck left, left remaining. And so they're trying to not only fix that particular signal, but also raise it up higher. Uh, and at the same time, we, we have you know, other signals that are failing because of other accidents, uh, because of the age and condition of the panels or the lights themselves, sabotage. Uh, or sabotage. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have quite a, a, a large task in, ahead of them. Uh, we appreciate those individuals that, that work uh, to support that that level of our infrastructure or that particular part of our infrastructure. Uh, but we have to have significant work ahead. And, and uh, when I say we, I mean all of us, because uh, there has to be a huge investment. Signals are not, are not uh, cheap. Right. Uh, they're very costly. And uh, you know we just happen to be at a moment in time where our signals, uh, where many of them were purchased at the same time. And therefore, as they were engineered with a certain lifespan, they're all failing uh, at a similar time. And, and I wish I could tell the residents that, that there was better um, capital improvement planning um, that, that looks at the life cycle of all of our equipment and prepares for its eventual um, end of life. Mm -hmm. uh, but that hadn't happened. And so we're, we're experiencing these things as they happen. But our hope is that we leave this in better hands than we received it, not only fix these problems, but ultimately create the type of dashboard that looks at the life cycle of equipment going forward. Okay. Um, what are you going to do, along with Capitol Police and JPD, about the racing, loud cars, and crime that seems to come with them? Yeah. Well, I will tell you that the Jackson Police Department has a, a highly coordinated effort that they're, uh, they're moving on and, and have been pursuing for some time. Uh, and I do believe that they work in conjunction uh, with other agencies, not only capital and, and their area of jurisdiction, but also the sheriff's department. Uh, what I would say to this individual is that, you know, it is a highly coordinated um, effort. Uh, now I'm not, and I'm not just talking about JPD's effort, I'm talking about those that are participating in the racing. They have a network where they're following uh, not only police scanners, they're, they're trying to, you know, when we identify an area that is a hot spot 
and we set up an operation in order to, to stop those activities from taking place, uh, they coordinate and, and organize amongst themselves to a new area. Uh, and so it's something that, that we have to be one more day diligent than they are, uh, work a day longer, you know, a little harder at it than they do. Uh, and prayerfully, we can, you know, with holding some people accountable, we can demonstrate that this is not an activity that is going to be permitted in the city. Uh, because it's not only harmful to other residents who are driving and in the vicinity, it's harmful to the people who are participating in it. And they may think that they're expert, you know, experts with handling a vehicle. Right. Um, but far too often those mistakes happen uh, with professionals, right. you know, in a, in a safe environment with guardrails and nets and all those things, we see hazards and disasters take place. Uh, and so they can't be, you know, too safe. And so we want to stop that from happening. Uh, lastly, I will say that, that this is one of those challenges that as you find a solution to one problem, uh, you, you know, another problem presents itself. Because as we've worked to, to repair and, and reconstruct some thoroughfares and pave some streets, what it has ultimately led to is now streets that are in condition sufficient enough for people to try to race on them. Right. Uh, there were thoroughfares, there were corridors that people would not have imagined trying to race on them. And it wasn't a real issue that the Jackson Police Department had to track behind. But now we do have those issues. Um, to piggyback off of that, how important would it be for residents? Because I know in some cases they set up tents in these neighborhoods mm -hmm. when they're getting ready to do stuff. So how important would it be for residents to, to speak out? If you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not looking for your name. Uh, we're not looking for, you know, to, to, to share that someone, you know, told us the information. We're just looking to have an effective response to this, this challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and not only do you have the challenge like someone, like the person mentioned in the, the question, mm -hmm of the racing itself, you also have the challenge of, you know, other nefarious activities that sometimes take place when people gather uh, for something like that. Um, we only have a little bit of time left in this segment, but, you know, you talked about coordinating a coordinated effort and just mm -hmm. talk a little bit about, I guess, how important is that when it comes to um, situations like this that impact the entire city? Yeah, well, you know, um, without getting into the politics of mm -hmm. jurisdiction and, and police departments, you know, when there is a department that currently has primary jurisdiction, uh, then what that means is that they get the majority of those calls. And we need to share information across the uh, departments that are, that are hosting information uh, because we don't live in a Hunger Games bubble. Uh, people move in and out of jurisdiction where they just see themselves as being in Jackson. Um, and so we need the coordination of each department sharing the information that they have so that we can ultimately resolve this challenge. Hunger Games and bubble. And other challenges. Hunger Games bubble, that, did you make? I didn't make it up, but uh, my, my wife and I are big fans. Uh, we've been watching it since the first one. <laughs> That's a little known fact. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, we're gonna take a quick break here. We're gonna come back here, and uh, I have a couple of interesting questions here that I'm sure you'll be eager, maybe not so much so, but uh, mm -hmm. eager to answer, so stick with us. We'll be right, right. back in just a few moments. All right. So I handle your media, so mm -hmm. I'm privy to a lot of the questions that the media often um, have surrounding just policies and things that mm -hmm. go on within the city. And so I'm not surprised to see this question, um, but I'm sure people will be interested mm -hmm. to hear your response. Not that long ago, you went to China. Mm -hmm. I uh, did. And so there's a question here. What did you do in China? Who went with you and who paid for it? Well, uh, first I'll start with who paid for it. Uh, the U.S. Heartland China Association uh, organization paid for the trip. Mm -hmm. uh, I went with mayors who live, uh, whose cities are either on or near the Mississippi River. Uh, so, uh, you know, all the way from Jackson, uh, the mayor, my good friend, uh, Tannehill, uh, mm -hmm. from Oxford, she had the opportunity to go with us. Uh, the mayor of Shelby County, Tennessee, uh, 
you know, mayors all the way up from uh, Missouri, uh, Columbia, Missouri, um, and uh, on up to uh, Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, the same city that the Mayo Clinic um, is, is housed. So there was a, a strong contingent of mayors from across the country uh, whose cities are all near or on the Mississippi River. Uh, and we met with mayors in China who are along the Yangtze River uh, so that we would talk about uh, not only economic development opportunities, uh, share sustainable um, you know, growth and, and challenges that we, we you know, similarly share, um, and you know, share best practices to better understand how we address those things. Uh, but then one of the other principal reasons that we took the trip was in an effort of subnational diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, it is no secret to people that uh, the U.S. and China's relationship uh, has been tense um, as of late, uh, from everything to the spy uh, balloon to, you know, questions over the Taiwanese strait. Uh, and sometimes we, we think that these issues are beyond what we deal with in Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're talking about sustainability, uh, you know, we live in a city that has had two 30-year floods within a four-year period of time. Uh, we know that we've had issues with our wastewater treatment facility. I had an opportunity right outside of the city of Shanghai uh, to, to learn about uh, cluster development that, that breaks down the wastewater treatment process in a less expensive way, uh, which they deal with populations that are much larger than ours. And so they've had success in those, in, in those treatment facilities. So we want to learn. Uh, you know, I, I think that, that we should always be open to broadening our horizons and, and understanding things better. Um, you know, on a personal aside, I, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned how limited my knowledge of the world was, and, and I consider myself a well-traveled person. I uh, had the blessing that my mother was a flight attendant mm -hmm. who often flew to China of, of uh, a few places when she worked for Northwest Airlines. Uh, but there were cities I'd never heard of or cities that I had heard of and I thought that they were far smaller than, than I would have imagined. Uh, we talk about Wuhan. I went to, so just to give a sense of my travels, I was there for about 15 days. Mm -hmm. uh, I started off in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. We went from Hong Kong to, we then flew to Wuhan. Uh, we went from Wuhan to uh, Nanjing, mm -hmm. uh, Nanjing to Suzhou, uh, Suzhou to Shanghai. Uh, and all of those cities uh, were just as some of the ones like Wuhan had maybe five to six million people. Uh, we think of Wuhan as like a village, right? right. When we talk about things like COVID and, mm -hmm. and you know, our sense of that is, is limited. Uh, Nanjing and Suzhou were about you know, I would say about 10 million people, uh, cities that are larger than New York that we've never heard of. And uh, Shanghai was about 30 million people. So wow. very, 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 very large cities. Um, and so it was, it was informative. Uh, and I think that there were good discussions. And, and, on the, and I'll finish with this. On the subnational diplomacy side, you know, some of the issues that may be important to nations, uh, such as uh, the issue of, uh, you know, the, the Taiwanese straight circumstance, mm -hmm. while important, you know, those aren't the everyday things that right. people in Jackson are talking about. They want to know, you know, how they make sure that their, you know, their, their streets are paved. They want to know how, uh, make sure that they, they have the drinking water that they need and, and that when they flush the toilet, it goes where it needs to go. Right. Um, and so while there may be issues that are important that need to be addressed on a national scale, there's an opportunity for a relationship between people who have common, uh, common challenges and, and have a common responsibility to address those challenges to say, listen, uh, while there's a lot that, that divides us and, and differences of opinion, there's a lot that unifies us mm -hmm. and, and a lot of shared responsibility. One is this planet and how we decide to maintain it and be responsible for it. You clearly learned a lot from them. Did the, what did you take to share with them? What did, what did you tell them about Jackson? Well, uh, they wanted to know about culture. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to know about, you know, some of the industry, the medical industry, and uh, the things that we offer, the fact that Jackson is a college town. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there was an eagerness to establish sister city relationships. Uh, I particularly met with one community from uh, the Mongolia region of China, and I found a lot of similarities, you know, Jackson being a majority minority city, uh, the Mongolian um, 
ethnic group is, is somewhat of a minority uh, in China, and so, uh, or they are viewed in the same way, and so there were parallels. What I did find funny is that um, as I met with different city uh, leaders, and, and their, their methodology of how they select leadership is, is different. They're usually appointed. Mayors are appointed by the president. Hmm. Um, but, you know, I was meeting with mayors who were saying, look, you know, I have a small city in China uh, along the Yangtze River. We only have about four million people, right? And I was like, eh, eh, that, your, your small city is, you know, our state, right? right? Uh, and so there, there are certainly some things that are different, but usually it's just a matter of scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the city of Jackson. This question came in, and we've heard you refer to a radical city. Mm -hmm. um, this person wants to know, has Jackson become the radical city you hope for? Mm -hmm. Well, let, let me say that what I've always expressed, you know, when I say radical is, is taken from what was initially a, ne a negative connotation. Um, and what I say about radical is a radical is a person who seeks change. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we look into our city, we look into communities, and we see a need for change, then I believe we should be as radical as the circumstances dictate we should be. Mm -hmm. uh, the short answer is while I think that there are a number of things that we're doing to restore dignity within our community, no, I'm not satisfied. There's a lot more work to be done. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that work should be, um, the evidence of that work should be not only done within City Hall, but done within community, uh, that we all have a role to play in that. Um, and and I, I still believe in the idea and I still believe that we can we can ultimately achieve that goal uh, because I see people you know no matter our differences that that do by and large care for a better condition for their children uh, for their neighbors um, and and I think that that being our greatest resource that we can achieve that 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 uh, end I never believed it to be an easy task right I never believed it to be something that we did overnight uh, and so we just have to keep pushing towards it. If you're gonna, if you're gonna focus on an area that needs the most radical um, improvement, where would you focus? Mm -hmm. That's a hard one. Uh, you know, when you have people who have been suffering from a failing infrastructure, uh, I think that the most radical change is how we view progress. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't think that it should just be a measure of whether we have new businesses and whether we're told that our economy is succeeding. It has to be in the quality of life that every individual enjoys. Yeah. Uh, the sustainability of the infrastructure, the quality of our education, the access to things like fresh fruits and vegetables so that people can be ensured that their children are living uh, healthy lives. Uh, all of those things restore dignity to people and they have an impact on the safety, the public safety. When people are getting more out of life, then they have a sense that they want to protect it and preserve it much longer than, than you know, people who are living day to day. Yeah. All right, well, that sounds like a good place to take another quick break. Stick with us. We'll be right back in just a few moments. Welcome back. So I'm going to read this question exactly as it's written. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why have you raised my water bill so much? Who is paying you to do this? <laughs> and the person, they put their bill. So the first in January, it was $76. In February, it was $69. In March, it was $92. Mm -hmm. So why, who's paying you to do that? Well, you know, I'm thankful for these type of questions because mm -hmm. it gives an opportunity to give information and clarity. Mm -hmm. uh, the city of Jackson, meaning myself and all of the individuals in my administration, uh, even the council, uh, nobody uh, from the city of Jackson uh, played a role in raising any water bill. Uh, it is operated by a third party manager uh, who is controlled by the federal court. Uh, and so we did not raise the bills. Uh, it was it was raised through the third party management uh, manager and the consent of the federal court. Um, and so my understanding as to why uh, they raised the bills is that they have a cash flow challenge. Uh, they have collected water bills at a lower rate than the city of Jackson was doing it. 
it is a significant challenge. It is a challenge that was in large part created uh, after we went to a new metering system and we then had a lawsuit uh, to address the fact that stranded bills were taking place. And when stranded bills happen, and what I mean by a stranded bill, that means that you do not consistently receive a water bill. And when you do not consistently receive a water bill, not only um, is that an inconvenience and a burden on you as the, as the rate payer, it's a burden on the city of Jackson because that we're not collecting enough to maintain the system. Uh, water, water bill revenue is supposed to not only take care of pipes, it's not only supposed to take care of the water treatment facility, all of the chemicals, maintaining it, the, the staff that works there. It's also intended to pay for a number of other infrastructure needs, uh, such as your sewer system. Uh, it maintains the pipes and the, the sewer issues that, that take place there, and uh, often the remediation that has to take place at homes where we're vacuuming out uh, sewer challenges from people's yards and, and the like. And so that revenue is necessary to do all of those things. And when it isn't consistently being collected, then they look for other ways in order to, to address those challenges and, and gain that revenue. So the city of Jackson, again, uh, did not raise your water bills. I have not raised your water bills. Um, that was uh, something that the third party manager uh, did and was consented to by the court. And I'm not saying that some level of raising the water bills didn't need to take place. Right. Uh, you know, this is what I've been talking about in terms of how we minimize the overall cost to residents because as our system has aged, uh, as we have more challenges to confront, we know that that can only be done uh, by the revenue that is present to do that. Jackson's water system, its pipes, our roads, we're all built at a time where our city was a lot larger, when we had uh, nearly or, or above 200,000 people. Wow. And when that population left, they didn't take the pipes with them. They didn't take the roads with them. They didn't take this infrastructure that we have to maintain with them. And so unfortunately, we have fewer people that have to stand in place to maintain uh, infrastructure that is older than the time that it was initially put in. And so I think that there is a balance to what is an appropriate rate and affordability. Uh, and I think affordability always has to be central. Uh, the old adage, and I'll, I'll end here, is that if you owe the bank you know, $10,000, you have a problem. If you owe the bank a million dollars, both you and the bank have a mm -hmm. problem. And in this instance, uh, the city of Jackson or, or you know, us as an entity that has to deliver services, uh, we would be considered the bank and we have a problem. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, Fondren, North Fondren, Bellhaven, and Loho neighborhoods have new businesses and services coming into the area monthly. We also see vast expansion and investment in surrounding cities. What is your plan to expand investments in other areas mm -hmm. and neighborhoods in Jackson? Well, those areas that you mentioned, uh, to be clear, it really doesn't take much effort on behalf of the city of Jackson other than issuing the permits that mm -hmm. the businesses, you know, inquire about when they want to develop. Those areas, um, because of the businesses that are already established there, uh, the surrounding wealth that's in that area, are what many businesses or developers call or consider investor ready. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that is why that takes place. So I don't want anybody to think that there's um, favor, you know, established on one side of town than the other. In fact, if, if there's, you know, favor, then, then it would be to the other parts that are disadvantaged and the need to incentivize its development. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're also trying to look at creative mechanisms that help support that such as our intentionality around trying to create a business incubator space in um, the uh, Union Station. And that business incubator is to develop cooperative businesses. Uh, you know, I, I tell people all the time that Jackson isn't a city that has a problem producing wealth. It's a city that has a problem maintaining wealth. And so all of the money that's made between nine and five just so happens to be out by six. And so we need to build establishment businesses worker-owned or community-owned businesses that part of its mission statement is not only to provide the service, uh, but also to serve the community in which it, it resides. And so that they don't leave out of West Jackson, they don't leave out of South Jackson for greener pastures, 
expecting those residents to still shop wherever they, they venture off to. Uh, it's important that we support black businesses and minority businesses, and we don't need to be apologetic about that. 85% right. of our population is left-handed, then we need some left-handed jobs. But even beyond supporting a black business, a black business is uh, a business operating in a capitalist society that takes advantage of markets. And so it can leave the market in which it's currently in with the expectation that it will get greater revenue from a different market. And so having worker-owned cooperatives not only allows you to fill the, the voids of grocery stores, the voids of retail spaces and restaurants within your neighborhood, it also allows you to establish that the, the mission statement of that business is to serve the community that, that has given uh, it its start. Yeah. I want to go back really quickly for like 30 seconds. We were talking about water. Mm -hmm. At one point, we were talking about town halls. Yes. Uh, and one specific to water. Talk briefly yes. about that. No yes. dates yet. Yeah, no, no dates, but we intend on having a town hall meeting uh, to hear the concerns that residents have uh, with respect to their water bills, uh, whether they've had pressure issues, boil water notices, if there's a concern over quality. Uh, we want to host that conversation. And we're going to invite Jackson Water. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're doing that not only to make certain that we have a, uh, a proper record of the challenges that residents are still seeing, but also to communicate what our sphere of influence is, what our ability is and is not, right? Uh, because we want people to know that. Um, you know, I know that I've said it before and, and we still get questions and that's okay because sometimes you have to repeat things for, for it to, to touch every part of the community that needs to hear it. But we want people to have real information. Uh, we want you to have facts. And uh, we want also to, to maintain that record so that those who have uh, responsibility over it now understand that there's a community that may not be heard and issues that may not be addressed. Um, before we go, our, it dawns on me that this is going to air in July. And July is the month of the ice cream safari. Yes. And I, it's a very important thing. Uh, I want to be clear uh, to the Jackson Fire Department in particular uh, <laughs> and, and all of the other uh, businesses and departments that participate in it. You've had your run. Um, you were successful, and I hope you enjoyed it while you had it. Uh, but the, uh, the mayor's office, uh, all of our team, uh, we're coming for that title. Um, and by the time you hear this, it'll be too late. Uh, you will not have all of the, the um, connected, uh, attractive things that we're going to do. Uh, and if you do, we'll be checking thoroughly through your budget to see how you afforded those things, because um, we're going to win. Mm -hmm. I do, you know, it's, it's all about fun. Uh, I'm grateful for the, the people who come out. We, we have a big crowd. Yes. Uh, last year's was so successful that you just about couldn't get parking mm -hmm. Broke in, record. The, in, in the Jackson Zoo. And so we want you to come out again and, and let's give some, uh, we want to visit and give company to, to the animals that are, that are housed at our zoo. And it's going to be July the 13th. Um, so if it's not July 13th, make sure that you come out. Tickets are on sale and make sure you come and check out the mayor's booth. We'll have something very, very special yeah. for you. Yeah. yeah. To all the runner ups, we appreciate y'all. <laughs> In the meantime, we are all out of time. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Don't forget to email us your questions. Also, you can uh, send those questions in on social media. Thank you for being a part of this, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.